Okay, what I'm going to talk to you now about is dimension and rank, and these are from sections 4.5 and 4.6 in your textbook. Primarily in this um, set of slides, we're going to talk about the definitions and theorems that are associated with that, and you should find those useful in solving problems. So the dimension of any vector space is the number of vectors in a basis of the space. So consider the polynomials P3, and these are all the polynomials look like A0 plus A1t plus A2t squared. And so clearly a basis for that vector space is 1, t, and t squared because all of the vectors in P3 are made up of linear combinations of those vectors. And those vectors are also clearly um, linearly independent, so that is a basis. And so the number of vectors in that basis are 3, and so the dimension denoted by dim of P3 is equal to 3. So from previous discussions, we know that for every n-dimensional vector space V, any set of vectors containing more than n vectors is linearly dependent. And this is because we had talked about this before. If you have an n-dimensional space and you have n linearly independent vectors, then those n linearly independent vectors form a basis. So if you have a set containing more than those n vectors, then certainly the vector space or that set of vectors in that vector space have to be linearly dependent because you have at least one vector too many. So if V is spanned by a finite set, then V is said to be a finite dimensional space. So what do we mean? And what we mean here is that if you can find a finite number of vectors that span a vector space, then that vector space is said to be finitely dimensional. Otherwise, it's infinitely dimensional. So here's an example. It will determine if the following spaces are finitely or infinitely dimensional. So you have this vector space of polynomials P3 that we just described on the previous slide. So that vector space is spanned by 1, T, and T cubed. Three, I'm sorry, 1, T, and T squared. That's three vectors that form the basis. So this is clearly finite dimensional. Now consider the set of polynomials, all polynomials. Um, then they would be polynomials that have degree as high as you would like them to be. And so these are infinitely dimensional. If you thought about a basis for that set of polynomials, that would be something like 1, t, t squared, t cubed, and that would continue on and on forever. So there's an infinite number of basis vectors, so it's an infinitely dimensional space. In this course, we're going to primarily talk about finite dimensional spaces, but there are certainly lots of applications of infinitely dimensional spaces. And so here's another theorem. It states for any subspace H of V, the dimension of H is less than or equal to the dimension of V. And that's just because we're taking a subset of the vector space, so there's no way that the dimension can be any larger than V. And the only thing that might happen is that we might need even fewer vectors from the vector space V to actually span all of the subspace H. So an important theorem is called the basis theorem, and this basically says that for any vector space V with dimension P greater than 1, any linearly independent set of P elements forms a basis for V. So we had talked about this in previous classes, and this is just the theorem that actually states that if you have an n-dimensional vector space, or in this case, a p-dimensional vector space, then p linearly independent vectors in that space will always form a basis for that vector space v. So if you're in R2 and you have two linearly independent uh, vectors that span R2, then those two vectors form a basis for R2. So the dimension of the null space of A is a number of free variables of ax equals 0. So you know if you solve ax equals 0, which is a homogeneous system of equations, if there are infinitely many solutions, then you will have free variables. And so the dimension of that null space will always be the number of free variables when looking at the homogeneous system of equations. And the dimension of the column space of A is the number of leading ones in the reduced row echelon form of a matrix A. So once we've put a matrix into its reduced row echelon form, we can count the number of leading ones, and this will be the dimension of the column space. And this is because those are the columns that are not linear combinations of the others. That's why they have the leading ones. Similarly, we could consider something called the row space and look at the reduced row echelon form of the matrix A. 
and the leading ones would then point to the dimension of the row space as well. <clears throat> so the row space of a matrix is all of the linear combinations of the, and that should be rows of A instead of columns for the row space. And so if A is row equivalent to a matrix B in reduced row echelon form, then A and B have the same row space. So if A is equivalent to a matrix B, that means that we can get from A to B via elementary row operations, then both A and B have the same row space, and therefore <clears throat> a basis for both A and B is the non-zero rows of B. So we can find a basis for a row space of a matrix A by first putting it into its reduced row echelon form and then looking at the leading ones in this B, which is a reduced row echelon form of A, and those will be rows that form a basis for all of the linear combinations of those rows of A. So here's an example. You have this matrix A above. And then B is the reduced row echelon form. So notice, for example, that there's a leading one in the first column, the second column. And then if I were to divide the third row by minus four, there would be a leading one in the fourth column. So we're going to answer a series of questions. So one question might be, what is a basis for the row space? So first, again, we look and see that we have leading ones in the first, second, and fourth columns. And so the first, second, and fourth columns of B form a basis for the row space. <clears throat> but it's also true that the first, second, and I'm sorry, as the first, second, and third columns of B have leading ones. And so it's also true that the first, second, and third columns of A form a basis for the row space. Now let's consider the second question. What is a basis for the column space? Well, we're still looking at the first second, and third rows that have leading ones in B, but what columns do they point to? Well, they point to the first, the second, and the fourth. So if you look in A, the yellow rectangles point to the basis vectors for the column space of A, namely the first column of A, second column of A, and fourth column of A. Now, unlike in the row space question, it is not true that the first, second, and fourth rows of B form a basis for the column space of A. And you can think about that and possibly come up with the reason why it's not true that those also form a basis for the column space. And then finally, what is the basis for the null space? Well, in order to find a basis for the null space, we need to look at the number of free variables that we would have. So if we considered A, as the coefficient matrix for a homogeneous system of equations, then it would have performed all of the elementary row operations to convert that A to B, and it would have had no effect on the right-hand side because in that case, the right-hand side would have been a zero vector. So the question is, what are or how many free variables do we have? Well, we have two free variables. They would come from the third column and the fifth column of B. So without doing any additional work, I do know that dimension of the null space is 2, because if we were solving a homogeneous system of equations, we would have two free variables. To actually find the basis, it would take an additional work, and that means we'd have to actually solve the homogeneous system of equations, and then from that, find the two vectors that made up all the linear combinations of that solution. So you go ahead and solve the homogeneous system of equations and come up with the two basis vectors for that particular matrix. So finally, we want to talk about this idea of something called the rank, and the rank of a matrix A is the dimension of the column space or row space of a matrix A. And so just remember the dimension of the column space and row space, both are just the number of leading ones after the matrix A has been put into its reduced row echelon form. And so, for example, here's my matrix A and B again. So what is the rank of A? And we simply want to look at the reduced row echelon form of A, which is a matrix B. And we see that we have one leading one in the first column, one in the second column, and then we would have one in the fourth column. So we have three leading ones. And so therefore, the rank of the matrix is three. <coughs> so finally, there's something called the rank theorem. And this states that the rank of a matrix A plus the dimension of the null space of that matrix
is equal to n for a and n by m matrix. So, and actually that should be m, should be m. It's equal to the number of columns, so it should be m. And so if I rewrite this, it's the rank of the matrix A plus the dimension of the null space. The A that just means null space should be equal to M. That should be changed and that should be equal to M. Um, actually, I have to apologize here because it looks like I have some typos. And so it looks like that on the top there I have N where there should be M. And on the bottom I have it the way I want it to be. So again, the, looking at this part of the equation, the rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A is equal to N, where A is in the matrices that are M by N. So just make that correction. The rank plus the dimension of the null space should be equal to the number of columns of the coefficient matrix A. Hope this helps.